All right, let's do that before I forget. <laughs> I've gotten really. You want to back you? Um, doesn't hurt. Haven't had any issues thus far, but you never know. So sure. <laughs> yeah. I'll need um, co-host permission. Oh, oh, uh, do you? Okay. Uh, security. Yeah. I, I might allow participants to start video. Share screen. Remove participant. I think I actually don't know how to do that. So I guess we'll just skip it. <laughs> it should be fine. Okay. So I haven't had any problems thus far. But um, okay. yeah. Like I said, the, the roadmap for this is basically a bit of an intro. Um, I, I have some trivia, uh, you guys style. Um, actually, before we really start, let me go ahead and put the prologue on a whiteboard so I don't have to do that in the middle of the episode. And um, yeah, you know, like a lot of people come in, they they want to do their rod, but you're perfectly welcome to go with the Shatner for this if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Oh I've my gosh! This... I've had people come on to just... like the Southern Madman or something too. So <laughs> he's still crazy in this. I mean, he just gets so manic. Like, what do I do? What do I say? Like, am I gonna get my promotion? I don't know. You know, like just... it's like the opposite of Captain Kirk, but it's like being played the same. So that's amazing. <laughs> he's um, how young was he in this? I mean, he was fairly young, right? I, I'll double check that real quick, but I'm going to say early 30s. It's just, uh, it's hard to rate his age now, isn't it? Uh, since he's, what, 90, what now? He's 91. Yeah. And 91. Um, I, I guess I could sit there and do the math, but eh, I got Wikipedia. <laughs> but I still got to do a little math from the birth date, but that seems easier. I mean, what year was this episode? Oh, uh, this is like nine, sorry, this is 1960. So he is. 29 and yeah. this wild okay yeah because that's so yeah that's about right he was 30 let's see 1965 35 or yeah 35 for track so which yeah. i guess is always what i assumed was the original captain kirk age anyway so <laughs> i mean he was like a little heavier i mean this this shatner was you know just a little leaner you know his Everything him was just a little younger, you know, it, it, and not not nearly as kind of mature looking as Kirk. But, yeah. um, Since we're not on the I mean, not to show say, yet, I, I will say I was sitting there wondering, is that his real hair? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't. I think feel like it was in the movies know. that he was really rocking the uh, fake stuff, but you know, he's so cagey about it; it's hard to know. <laughs> it but, was uh, thinning. Like I know that Sean Connery is when he was doing Bond, he was wearing a hairpiece already. Just because it was so thin, um, mm. Shatner's you can tell it's kind of wispy, but not too thin. And then, yeah, by the time we got to like, you know, uh, the the motion picture, he went for like the full kind of like seventies perm. Yeah, you know? yeah, that that was definitely. I mean, the the piece by then that was when I was a kid. That was yeah. one of the biggest problems. I besides the monster maroons, <laughs> that was like the biggest problem I had with the uh, TOS movies. I'm like, it's, he doesn't. He doesn't really look like Captain Kirk, <laughs> you know, to a five. I know it's right? weird. There's a, um, <laughs> there's a, uh, a, a, it's like a really, really quick, maybe one or two minute, um, cutting room floor test of Star Trek Phase Two with Shatner and Robert Reed, who played Mike Brady, doing you know, the Brady Bunch, who was like his friend, and uh, they were wearing the uniforms. But they didn't have the insignia on them. And then Robert Reed was rocking the Mike Brady perm. And it was just this weird back and forth. And Shatner's hair looked fucking awful. It was like, I don't know what it was. It was like in between like his 60s hair and his perm. Like he couldn't figure out like what they wanted to do with his hair. I got to find that. It's just odd. I feel like I've seen that. Yeah. Sometimes I like to Mike Brady it to the office when when possible. Works better in winter because you got the suit. So, I mean, you know, in Japan, suit and a tie. So people don't notice the insanity of your shirt quite as much. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, rocking the mic. I can't do the hair. I, I could for a brief period, but it's uh, gone now. Last year, I sort of had a Mike Brady, like mini fro going out, which is awesome. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that is, that's don't my... go full Mike Brady, man. That's, that's a world breaker. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you take the Gary Cole version, slightly different, slightly more tongue-in-cheek <laughs> there you go 
Yeah. I always wanted him. Like I liked him in uh you know as um and as the captain in uh Crusade, but I always wanted to see him somewhere along the line in Trek. I just think that he has that kind of you know like like one of those kind of ships that's there like to help save the day. Like you know the way that Kelsey Grammer did like with the Bozeman, you know, it's Morgan mm. Bates, Morgan Bateson. Okay. You know, it's all of a sudden it's like Gary Cole. You're like, yeah, dude. It's not not too late. We can do that still. So <laughs> Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Guys that I've always wanted to see, like as captain, like I've always wanted to see Ben Browder as a captain somewhere. I think it's just he's just very stereotypical. Um, uh, Kyle Chandler uh, from Friday Night Lights, um, okay. amongst other shows. Like he's just he's like if if it weren't Scott Bakula, I would have freaking like given my other kidney for like Kyle Chandler to be captain on Enterprise. <laughs> he would have been perfect. Right, coming right off of Friday Night Lights would have been amazing. Actually, you could take. To... Hmm? I was just sitting here trying to think of who who I I guess I've never had like a captain desire. My my obsession when I was young was like thinking about who would play the X Men like in the early nineties, right? <laughs> oh yeah. When it seemed when and the idea they of that still seems... haven't gotten any of them right. Not quite. No, there's there's segments no. like you know everyone hated three, which it's not a good movie, but it's like I do like the sequence at the end. It just felt like you know an eighties comic to me. So you know you gotta. Uh, I've seen a lot because my wife's obsessed with Hugh Jackman too, so that's always a good balance of okay, you can see Hugh Jackman, I can watch a sci-fi ish movie. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. But Hugh Jackman, you know, like if you want to get like pedantic about the X, but he's pretty much like a what two feet taller, you know, than Logan should be. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He's supposed to be like yeah, small and scrappy. So, but man, then I, fastball special that, you know. But you know the 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 prodigy message boards was a bunch of twelve year olds, me being one of those twelve year olds. We were like, "Oh, well, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be Wolverine, right?" <laughs> it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and start this, and we'll uh, uh, let oh yeah, basically we we'll do the trivia or the intro, the trivia, the prologue, and then I'm just gonna let it run will it, where it will. I have one wiki page I'm gonna bring up at some point, but. Otherwise, I don't know what we're going to talk about. And uh, at some point, I'll just hit the uh, the last three questions. So um, do you have a, a, a not that I'm going to take up all your time, but do you have like a, a hard out time? Um, Not really, no. OK, you know? OK. I eventually do because I have to go to work, but, <laughs> okay. you know, I got enough time to do this by by far. So uh, okay. give me just maybe three seconds of silence so I can spot it on the uh audio file when I edit and we'll we'll get rolling. Sure. Hello. Welcome to Time Enough Podcast, where we delve deep into episodes of the Twilight Zone and beyond. This is Matt here. Joining me today is uh oh I, I bring I, I say if you can talk Trek well, you can talk the Twilight Zone pretty well. So uh we have another one of the, the mission loggers coming in from the flagship show. It's Norman Lau. Hello. Hello. I'm not sure if uh, you want me to stay in character or maybe not. I could talk like this the entire night. I'm a little <laughs> lamped up. I got questions to ask you. I have levers to push. I have slips of paper to pull. I can do you it all. The, you got the space coffee mug. I spotted that. I do have the space coffee mug. I have uh, for my iced coffee and my tomato sandwich <laughs> with lettuce and uh, stale wheat bread. So, so I don't know. I could, you know, the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> that, that, I, I was wondering how far you go. Um, my well, you've talked to Luke, one of my my uh, co-hosts, who um went full Batman villain through an entire um forty five minute podcast. So, <laughs> well, as, I can. I mean, Matthew, this is a, this is your puzzler. show. This is my show. You know, yeah, we could, yeah, yeah. We could do it any way you want. Uh, <laughs> I can stay in character. I can. Go all the way back to the 1960s and uh, stay the part. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the tone down you know, version. Uh, you know, just uh, think about and ruminate <laughs> on uh, my role in this particular episode, uh, or or not, because it can get really, really, really annoying if I do that. So, <laughs> well, what, what's fun is um the the multi accent. Well, one thing is you're you have the the pretty good Shatner impression, so you can hold it. But uh, you know, you know a lot. Of, times even on this show i have people they start doing one impression on the prologue mm -hmm. especially and kind of like drift into somewhere else and like by the end <laughs> they're like doing some completely different voice that's always fun too but uh yeah we're, we're getting all the chat all the chat today because this is nick of time which is i don't know if it's his first appearance on television i'm sure he had a few before this uh rolling down from canada to la was uh 
I'm sorry. I'm actually looking to see exactly when his career started. Years. Oh, years active 1951. Okay. So he probably mm -hmm. done a few things before this. <laughs> well, they were like, uh, I, you know, I delved into uh, small parts. Uh, I was looking for feature films and uh, my luck the never really quite off. Hit. There's the first one. Oh, wow. I did some uh, Henry the When did he do The Intruder? The Intruder was a very interesting film. Oh, no, no, the one that I always watched was Incubus, but that's because I'm nuts. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know Incubus? I have heard. I don't think I've seen that or that, been able to get a copy of it. Yeah, that I, I remember seeing in Borders, actually, where they sold it. Uh, sorry, uh, Intruder is 1962. So. Okay. Incub and I get I think Incubus is still Roger Corman because Intruder is Roger Corman. So um, but yeah, the, the thing about that movie is the entire movie is um Esperanto. So <laughs> you have Shatner speaking Esperanto through the entire thing. So oh, what I mean, about I White Comanche? When did that come out? Oh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Where he played too. twin brother Native Americans, which was oh, ouch. So many levels of insulting right there. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know about that one. I, I thought Incubus was as weird as he gets, but apparently mm. not. Nope. <laughs> Vivid, a fiction, non. Oh man, I, I got his disc got music. He's such a multi talented man. The Transformed Man's here. Oh, The Transformed Man is one of my <laughs> signature pieces. Oh, okay. You know, uh, oh, oh, it's filmography so long it has a separate page. That's why. Okay. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, sorry. What, what was the name one more time? Oh, White Comanche. Nineteen. White Comanche. Sixty-eight. He was still doing Trek when he did that. So that's that's a weird, like, kind of. Um... It's like tapping into his inner Kirok right there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was like, uh, just showed up. He was still wearing the costume. Like, okay, just just get into this weird chamber and do your thing we're just going to save on budget here and just use the same you know uh same costume that you were using <laughs> it was right across the lot right so it's easy that right. way do you know what i'm gonna have lunch have... and then i'm gonna do a movie so yeah it could be that sort of thing i mean it, it happens so <laughs> um <laughs> okay actually we got more more uh shatner trivia than i i thought we were going to there so that's kind of cool I have a little bit of trivia uh -huh. of my own for this one, so I'll just uh, get through that real quick. All right. The original air date for this one is November 18th, 1960. Uh, this episode was written by Richard Matheson, so I, I think Nick at times about the point where I get to say that uh, this is the writer giving Rod the most proper competition as, as far as scripts are concerned. Uh, just, I mean, not to, not to get too deep into why I think of the episode yet, but uh, I think it's well written. <laughs> uh, hmm. We've talked about director Richard L. Bear before. He's been in the zone in the past. He'll be here in the future, and his batting average for the episodes he does are pretty high. Uh, they tend to be relatively iconic ones. Uh, Don S. Carter is played by William Shatner, star of White Comanche. Um, he will make one more appearance in the Twilight Zone in the probably more uh, famous uh, nightmare at, oh God, is it 20,000 or 30,000 feet? It's one of those. <laughs> I think it's 30,000 feet. But let me ask you something, though, before you get more of your trivia. Do you really think that that's the, it's really hard uh, to say which one's the more popular one? Uh, probably the one with the gremlin on the plane, though, it's because it's been aped so many times. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Like this one, um, it's just like, oh, this one tends to be like the other one with Shatner. And then you watch right. it, you're like, oh, it's pretty good. But uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the nightmare is definitely the one that sticks. Although this one has its merch too, because you can, you know, buy the little devil and put it on whatever you want. And hey, maybe you can get, I think you can get the whole machine. So, you know, oh, and I have. Your house and, uh, yeah, just never, never leave your house getting weird fortunes and things. <laughs> uh, I've created my own diner. I've created my own diner. It's it's a scale version. It has uh, the trellis. It has the uh, the mouthy cook. Uh, it has a uh, endless supply of iced coffee and the machine. So when I don't want to go anywhere, I hit ticket and then I play the part and I leave nothing to chance. <laughs> now that one was. When you started, it just sounded a little bit Trumpy too. <laughs> I got a diner, fantastic diner, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, who else do we have here? Patricia Breslin played Pat Carter. While she had several recurring roles on TV shows like Peyton Place and The People's Choice, what got my attention were her appearances in William Castle films like Homicidal and I Saw What You Did. Hmm. So, uh. Okay, here here's here's the big the big bear for you to bite. 
if you want right. to if you want to really throw your Shatner on, you know, we're going to throw Rod Serling off the bus for this one. And and if you want to take it full Shatner, that that'll be awesome. So let's see. Uh, in terms of reading this, <clears throat> the hand belongs to Mr. Don S. Carter, male member of a honeymoon team en route across the Ohio countryside to New York City. In one moment, they'll be subjected to a gift most humans never receive in a lifetime. For one penny, they will be able to look into the future. The time is now. The place, a little diner in Ridgeview, Ohio, and what this young couple doesn't realize is that this town happens to lie on the outskirts of the Twilight Zone. All right, that's fun. Since I'm looking at this, the shared screen, I was like playing a little game, like where is he going to put the pauses? So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know myself. And I don't think that Shatner knows either. I think that's the fun of it all. Right? Oh, that was a fun. I was like, I have no clue where he's going to put the pauses. So that was, mm -hmm. that was, that was interesting. Um, now, the first thing, watching this again last night, uh, this one I did get my proper several views over several months for various reasons. But um, I was like, he's so excited about becoming the world's youngest office manager, which 29, uh, Shatner was 29 when we did it, so we'll assume Don Carter is too. And I'm like, oh, probably some, I mean, it's done. I mean, Starship Captain at 35, that's impressive, but office manager at 29 is kind of like, well, whatever. Worldwide youngest office manager at 29. Yeah, how does he know that? <laughs> because the world to him is as, be as big as the state of Ohio. You know, I mean, it's kind of like small town ambition, you know? Just yeah, yeah. Yeah, such small dreams, I guess. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that was um, uh, not a criticism on the episode, but just, I guess, part of the fascinating thing of watching him in here, because in Nightmare, he's just, you know, he's like pretty much off his rocker mo or getting off his rocker most of the time, where here he's definitely doing a Shatner, but it's just like um, I, I was saying before we really got in into recording that it's it's like the opposite of a Kirk. This guy's just like unsure of everything and, you know, can't make decisions almost, you know, without this machine. Well, it's like the enemy within version of Kirk, but the one without the barbarism, you know, the one that always doubted himself, you know, because he's always looking at something to say, am I right? Am I good? Am I promotable? You know, am I marriable or marriage material? You know, everything to him is basically like, like preying on his own doubt and his own um, deficiencies. I, I guess that's imposter syndrome, right? So you can uh, step yeah. up, step to the plate and do all your stupid stuff confidently, or uh, yeah, you can you can do it this way if you want. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's like the old Stuart Smalley thing. We needed Don uh, Don Carpenter to look at that mirror and say, "Am I good enough? Mm -hmm. Am I smart enough?" And gosh darn it, people like me. Yeah, yeah, really. I, I don't think this diner had any um had any mirrors to speak of, but uh. I have had the where, where's my getting stuck in a small town situation and eh, not quite a small town, but I did have, um, I think it was a three, maybe five car, three to five car pile up somewhere near Stamford, Connecticut, which um, punched a hole in my radiator, which oh. they, they, that was the end of the car. So I had to wait for my parents to drive from Atlanta, Georgia, and I hung out in a hotel room for a few days. And th this was actually, um, this is about 2002. So it's before we all had our, our, you know, our mobile tech and stuff, but I, I was driving up to go teach in Maine. So I had like two guitars, a bunch of DVDs, I, a lot of TV. I had my own TV because I was, you know, going to be up there for like six months or whatever. So I basically moved into this hotel room for a few days. So that was kind of fun, but a uh, very different experience than getting stuck in this small town, I guess. Uh, any, any fun small town situations on your end? Actually, I'm from small town, Ohio, believe it or not. This town? <laughs> uh, not this small. I, I mean, I've driven through towns like that small, but I'm a, originally from a small town called Alliance, Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, Stark County. And it's kind of town where it's, it's big enough that it has its own college, but it's small enough where most of the people know everyone else's business, especially when you go to, you know, the local high school or local grade school and, you know, who got in trouble with who or whose parents got in other parents' business, stuff like that. Uh, there are places in that town where you could go and sit at a, you know, like one of those banquets with, uh, the, the 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 paper napkin holder and the very kind of throwback style of uh you know 1960s diner i mean you could easily stick like the demon machine that's what i'm going to call it because i don't know what else to call it but like the demon fortune machine on one of those tables just just for kicks and i know that somewhere out there like um 
one of those sci-fi merchandise, you know, wholesalers, they sell that machine, you know, with a little jeweled eye and everything on the little devil head. Um, question is though, who fills the tickets in those machines? Is that the real power behind the machines? That's Maybe. what I want to know. Maybe. Uh, it makes me think of the um the Simpsons where Homer Homer Simpson's trying to decide uh if he should like run off with the 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 younger woman. And uh, mm -hmm. he, I don't even remember what his fortune is. It's like, oh, you should try new things or something. It cuts to the the back where, uh, <laughs> hey, we're out of these. Oh, just start putting in the stick with your it's wife cards now. <laughs> well, I think it's the cook, man. It's always the cook that's re like responsible. That he's kind of smarmy, right? Like he's all about, um, you know. I know that you like these tomato and lettuce and bread sandwiches or whatever, but you really should try the chicken fried steak. I'm pushing the chicken fried steak pretty hard today. So because it's expired tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And he needs to sell it by three o'clock. So see, the tickets work in his favor. Like stay here so I can sell you some chicken fried steak and iced coffee because that's a winning combo. Right. Yeah. I was gonna say there's not necessarily anything supernatural going on in this episode. Although going by that theory, maybe he's kind of like the uh the man of the twilight zone screwing with everyone. That, that that's a that's a few hurdles to jump, but uh but I do want to throw that idea that maybe nothing, nothing weird is actually happening in this episode. You know, the cook is filling in the cards and not thinking about it. <laughs> right. You know, so it's one of those things where, you know, when um, you're like late to a party and like all the, the fun jokes have already been told and most of the people there are already drunk and you kind of come in and like, ah, this vibe isn't for me. So think about it this way. Like you walk into this diner and you see, you know, the carpenters and they're fraught with despair and they're pumping pennies into this machine and you're just kind of like sipping on your malt and like what the heck is wrong with these people you know you're not you are not influenced by the twilight zone at all you're just watching these people going nuts and then they leave and then that other couple comes in and they start going nuts and you're like people just get in your car and drive down the road you'll be out of this situation in like five minutes right <laughs> but the twilight zone again hits people differently right yeah, yeah. And um I, I guess at some point you're gonna get maybe even multiple couples in there. Well no, they have to be at the one machine. Maybe maybe they you know fight over the machine. I don't know. Um Oh, that would be great. Can you imagine like a sequel to this where that like people are literally like murdering each other to get their fortune? That, yeah, <laughs> not a terrible idea. Um right. I, I was it did remind me, and I I don't know if I mentioned on this particular podcast, but um uh, th since COVID, I haven't seen this happening, but I, I take the train to work and at one not kind of medium sized station, not one of the major ones, but uh, not one of the real tiny ones. And um, there's this guy because people are really into trains in, in Japan. So uh, there's a guy about 18, 19, you know, probably not probably isn't completely all there, but uh, he's on the train platform making train announcements um, in Japanese. Right. Next week I come, there's a different person doing that on a different platform. And then not long after that, they're both there competing with each other, like yelling train announcements over each other from different train platforms. So real announcements for real trains, or are they just making it up? They're just making it up. Although the trains are coming. They're just really excited about the trains coming. So, whoa, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, like I said, I think maybe they're not all there too, but there are people that are just like really obsessive about that sort of thing. But yeah, it made me think like, people fighting over the machine or kind of like people shouting fake train announcements at each other from different train platforms. <laughs> yeah. I took a, I took a, um, because I'm, you know, this is like the mission log way of looking at an episode. I've taken a bunch of notes. I was wondering if you would be, you know, willing to entertain a couple of the weird things that I spotted in this episode. Oh, by all means. <laughs> all right. So at the very beginning of the episode, the step, like there was a lot going on with like the non steady cam, like it's like, almost like mounted on top of like the winch of the tow truck, like looking down on Don and Pat Carter. It, it just seemed a little odd because it was so unstable. Did you see that? Did you, did you feel like the camera was just a little wobbly, a little wacky? Yeah. I, yeah. I also thought it was kind of like bizarre. They were in the car. Cause I feel like they don't let you stay in the car. They're towing. <laughs> Usually you're up in the cab, like with yeah. the tow truck driver. Yeah. Even in like 1960, I'm pretty sure that they would be like, come on up to the cab, please. You know, yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, that, that actually, you know what? I don't think I noticed the camera so much because I was sitting there like, why are they in the car? So, <laughs> yeah, that, that was weird. They're kind of like smiling at each other, like, oh, you know, it's just 
happens every day. We get picked up like this. Um, well, they're they're having their sort of honeymoon, right? And they're in their honeymoon glow, I think is what they say. So, you know, you just got married. You have a good time where you are. Um, he he, ha- I, well, he tries to have a good time at the diner, doesn't he? He just gets obsessed. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I, I saw that it cost a penny. And I'm like, why a penny? Like, why not a nickel? Why not a dime? Of course, you know, the currency was way different back then. But then I got to this whole, like, penny for your thoughts motif with the machine like they have a thought here's a penny penny for your thoughts here's a fortune so it started this whole kind of downward spiral of every like obviously whatever don was thinking wasn't influencing influencing the machine but it's like that's that old saying right you know here's a penny for your thoughts and now that started this whole downward spiral just for that little bitty coin i love he's just dumping like change out on the table um again i I'm I'm a little suspicious of the diner owner. Like he's he's always kind of in their face and not in a very hospitable way. Like it's either you're not ordering the right thing or she's well, what else can I get for you? But he did get he does get tipped twice, which is nice. You know, like Don doesn't want to make a change. Here's just a couple bucks, and I'm probably way overpaying for my sandwiches, which is funny. Um, why here's a question though. Why didn't Don ever let Pat read her own tickets? That's well, one, yeah, I guess. Maybe she's not into it. Maybe, maybe yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm adding in what headcanon that maybe she's not into fortunes or something, and they know that. But yeah, uh, it gets back to his obsession, though. And uh, I, I told you I brought up a, a wiki page before getting into this, and mm-hmm. this is what actually came to my mind with his obsession. Uh, have you heard of a Jerusalem syndrome? No. Okay. This is. Um, th- I mean, this is one of the things that's not like. There has been like actual psychologists have talked about, but it's not the sort of thing that's like le- completely like a real thing. But uh, someone did make the description, psychological description in the early 30s about people who will visit Jerusalem or like the Holy Land uh, with no previous uh, history of mental illness and then just go psychotic while they're there. Like they might get a, a messianic complex or just get really paranoid. Like there's people following me or like, They'll just suddenly decide, oh, I'm in Jerusalem for like the most important time in the history of the world. You know, just like wild delusions of of grandeur when they come into the Holy Land. And I almost wonder if like this little town has like a small version of that where these guys become like obsessive over, you know, this machine or whatever. I mean, I think that it's an interesting like character study in in like what Don wants out of life and then how he's kind of like the perfect vessel to get fed all of this and like manipulative information. I mean, the first thing that we saw, he's like emptying out his pockets. You see the rabbit foot and the lucky clover. I mean, you like, that's about as like superstitious of kind of like charms as you can like have like in, in one keychain. And then there's the whole kind of like self doubt thing with, I got to like spend, you know, nearly a buck, you know, and, and buck in those times can probably buy you like half that lunch. You know, he spends like a buck to call his work just to see whether or not he made the, you know, made the uh, world's, you know, youngest list of uh, office executives or whatever he was, you know, paper pusher. But it, it's important to him, you know, it's, it's so important to him, like to make sure that everything is kind of like buttoned down and, and going his way. And one thing, you know, just one little thing that like sets him off, sets off this entire uh, downward spiral of, of paranoia and fear. And it's, to be honest with you, like I don't think the episode really is an epic episode. I don't think it's actually even really a great episode. It's very good, but it's cast well. If it weren't for William Shatner in that role, and you know what, I'm I'm coming from it from the standpoint of I'm bringing the legacy of William Shatner into watching this. I'm not necessarily watching it as if I would have watched it back in 1960. So I'm wondering if people were like, yeah, it's a good episode. You know, this kid's, you know, he might make it someday, you know, decent enough actor, you know, he sold the script or, you know, is it really hard to separate now the legacy of the man from an episode like this and say, of course, this episode's great because of him, but he's not even really not the best version of William Shatner in this, you know? Yeah. That's where I was like saying this one's kind of fascinating for not being his super, I mean, people know it, but it's, you know, like again, nightmare is the one that he's definitely known for. People know. That all, almost as much as they do know Kirk, you know, a little less probably, but um, but this one, yeah, you you can't watch this with 1960s eyes at all because you're seeing right. like one of the better known actors on the planet, you know, looking like himself. You know, there are sometimes you might see a, an actor and they're so young, um, you know, it's like when you see pictures of 
guys that were born middle age, like like Bruce Willis or young Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a picture, mm -hmm. you know, that just doesn't look quite right. <laughs> right. And they almost kind of like look half baked. You know, they're not quite fully formed yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's part of the charm of this is that we do get the uh, fully formed uh, Shatner. And, and I never quite I never quite fully answered your question about why isn't the wife doing fortunes? Um, partly maybe it's 1960 television. Although, I mean, the Twilight Zone gets past a lot of 50s conventions, but, mm -hmm. you know, when you're breaking ground, you're going to be held back a little bit too. I was Fair. also thinking if, if, say, you and I were at a diner and you start getting fortunes, I might just be like, I don't feel like wasting my, my money on that. Um, you know, I, I remember spring break in high school, we all went and everyone decided to like bungee jump, right? Or do the, it was like the bungee swing or something. And it looked fun. I wasn't like scared about it, but I was like, well, if I save the $35, I can buy the police box set, which is actually what I did. So <laughs> smart. But in this case, though, she's actually the one that's pushing, like she's pushing the lever and she's putting the penny in. He's the one who's pulling the slip. So it's like she's doing, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like she's asking the questions, but he's interpreting the answers. So it all feeds into his paranoia and really none about her. Right. You know, she's not. It's kind of like the circuit, you know, like if you're going to do act one and act two and act three of a specific mental action, you have to have the resolution and she's not getting the resolution. So she's not involved. It has really no effect on her because it's the Pavlovian lever syndrome, you know, like you hit the lever, you get the pellet, you eat, and then there's no more food. So you hit the lever, you pellet, you eat, you know, and then you mm -hmm. do it ad nauseum so that, you know, you don't go hungry. Well, she doesn't get to finish that. So she's like, ah whatever. I don't care, you know, because I don't get to read my own slip, you sexist bastard, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would have told her? Something very vague, probably. But <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about portents. I've, you know, I, I, I don't think I've gotten obsessive like this guy over this sort of thing, but uh, what, what do we get obsessed about? In university, uh, I, I remember the late night sessions where everyone would sit down with like the purity test or something and obsess over those for a while. So um, I, I guess surveys get people's attention. Th this one's a little more akin to gambling, I guess, fortune telling or, or gambling a little bit, right? Well, you know what? It, it does prey on kind of like your your deepest, darkest fears. You know, they, I used to, um, you know, we used to watch our, our science fiction here in the United States, you know, like midnight, one o'clock, then all of a sudden kind of like these fortune telling you know, shysters come on like these commercials and like, you know, if you want, do you want to know your fortune? Do you want to know if you're going to make a lot of money? Do you want to know if you're going to be happy, if you're healthy, if you're going to have cancer, all this kind of stuff. So it's these 1-800 or 1888 numbers that pop up on the screen. That's essentially like the modern version of what's happening in the diner. You know, he wants, he's getting just enough information to make him pump in another penny to pull the lever and then get another ticket or push the lever, get another ticket. Because there's nothing magical about the machine. Everything is happening in the psychosis of what's happening in the downward spiral of when he's sitting there because that's the person he is. And I think that actually, you know, when you really take a look at it, Pat's got a lot of thinking to do because she just basically saw kind of like her fiance just crack like in front of him or in front of her. Right? Yeah, not not a great honeymoon. I don't know. I guess he gets over it, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, they seem to they, they drive off uh, relatively happy in the end. Um, yeah. We but like, you know, going back to the, like, what do we obsess over? I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, it's like the magic eight ball. It would have been really interesting if they like did a magic eight ball version of it in a modern day setting, you know, like somebody, you know, you're at a, you're at a party with a bunch of friends, you know, maybe you've had like one too many things to drink. And all of a sudden you find this magic eight ball in the corner in a pile of junk, then you start shaking it. And it doesn't have the traditional, you know, maybe seems so looks good. That kind of thing. What if it just got, what if it kept changing you know, because there are only like what it's a, there's a pyramid in there. So there are only like one, five, six, you know, ans possible answers that you can you can get, you know, by shaking that, you know, the, the magic eight ball. And all of a sudden it starts having these wacky, like random, you know, uh, like fortune telling answers. You're like, no, this is impossible. This an eight ball shouldn't be able to do this. Right. And then you give it to somebody else. You're like, of course, it's like this is the basic generic eight ball. Right. But to this person, it really fed into the psychosis and started making them see things that weren't there yeah i i almost wonder if the the um the novelty is part of the problem for him because i'm thinking in japan you know we tend to get our fortunes at new year's and other times if you have a test you might go buy a fortune and you pass mm -hmm. through the gates with the you know the oni the, the the guardians which are somewhat demonic looking right and you get your fortune um 
the main point is I, I got this one that I actually got in Tokyo like 15 years ago, but uh, I just have to read a bit of my fortune because mm. it's the worst translation ever. <laughs> so oh, the it, fortune? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, number 31, final, the least fortune. A chance doesn't come yet, so a large can't change into a giant bird. Everything is not ready to move on. Stand still on the shoreline, waiting for a good chance in future. A chance is coming to the fish to be a giant bird. The giant fish is merely to fly to the sky, pushing up the waves. Everyone can earn the big fame when he meet a chance. So I, I, am, I guess I've obsessed over this bizarre fortune because it's been in my wallet for 15 years. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, what, what, what do you think it means? Um, actually, uh, I, I should throw out that I also have good fortune. Um, it makes a little bit more sense when you see the good one, because they're just like, it's like someone translated the good one, still not well, and then like translated that into the, the other one. And it, it just lost all meaning. Cause this one says an arrow you shoot always gets the target. Everything you do will get quite well, you know, that mm. makes more sense. Right. But then you right. transliterate that to the bad fortune and you just get gibberish. So <laughs> Well, you know, it's kind of like, um, like anything like reading into a horoscope or like, you know, believing in a fortune cookie that you pull out of, you know, basically like overcooked pastry. Yeah, it's, it's all about the power of suggestion, you know, like, are you that person or are you not? I mean, that's like what, you know, that's why it's kind of like, uh, going back to, was it WC feels like a money, a fool and his money are soon parted. You know, because all you have to do is to say, Hey, this is going to change your life. This is going to cure everything. This is going to change your fortune. And you're going to throw a lot of money at it just the way that, you know, that Don Carter did, you know, with the machine. So it's all about, you know, he, he was the, the right person at the right time for that machine. You know, he was unsteady, you know, underconfident, you know, full of doubts and he's going into a new life, you know, he's going to maybe get that new job. Maybe he's going to, his vacation is going to be good. A lot of maybes in the air, you know, and then all of a sudden his car gets, you know, trashed and he's like, oh man, everything's terrible. Let's go get really terrible sandwiches and really terrible service and terrible water. And all of a sudden, the one thing, this one thing makes sense to him is it's this weird fortune machine that pumps out like a, a, a semi-cohesive, semi, you know, um, uh, semi-wise, you know, type of uh, uh, piece of advice. And he's like, this is the only thing that's making sense to me right now. And it's not even really making sense, but it's the only thing I got because everything else kind of is weird. It, it, like I said, like looking at it from the, the bare structure of the uh, or the architecture of the uh, episode it's very basic. You know, it's a very basic, like, you know, this guy, he's not, he doesn't have maybe like the best handle on life. And then he does, but then all of a sudden you throw William Shatner in there. You're like, wow, this episode is amazing. It's <laughs> epic. It's everything. And I'm wondering, you know, there are a lot of great actors who are great now that weren't great then, but we're in the twilight zone. I'm wondering who do you think would have been just as good, if not better in that role? from like the alumni that has come through the twilight zone, you know, um, not to put you on the spot. It's just kind of like a general question because like, you know, the, um, the nightmare, at like 30,000 feet, you know, and William Shatner, you know, he's very iconic in that role, but then, you know, in the twilight zone, the movie in the 1980s, you know, John Lithgow played that role also just as great, but yeah, very different you know, version, but very, very different, different version. version. Right. But I think it's just almost as memorable because John Lithgow is such a good actor. So take this story, like who would have been like, let's put like Gary Lockwood, you know, he's, you know, in that same kind of um, that, that same age range, a peer group of William Shatner's, would he have pulled off the episode just as well, or would have been better or worse? Yeah. See, I guess he'd be missing in a bit of the intensity in a way. So, um, I mean, he's great on screen, right? But he doesn't. Uh, again, it's it's like you said, the whole legacy thing. There's just like this certain like, oh, I know what this flavor is going to be when you get Shatner on screen. Where Gar- Gary Lockwood, right. again, he's probably because he's a better actor. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to get when he's on screen. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that's I mean, uh, that's an interesting thing. Like uh, Kirk. Well, true. Um, William Shatner has a very specific lane. You know, you can get just. He goes for it, you know, almost like abashedly, you know, and shamelessly, you know, he just goes for the, the, I get the honesty of the role, you know, and he's sometimes when you watch his eyes light up, which were like super mascara in this episode, by the way, it was very strange, (laughs) right? But I guess that was the the pancake makeup style of time, but, you know, he just, 
he he acts a lot with his eyes. You know, sometimes he's very leery. Sometimes he's very condescending. Sometimes he's overexcited or sometimes he looks like, you know, the wind just got like knocked out of him. So he's, that's the stage training. You know, that those are the kind of things that you need to sell a stage. You know, when he was the Royal Shakespeare Company and, um, you know, in, in Canada, I think it was British Columbia, along with, you know, Christopher Plummer. So you have to sell those big, big, you know, facial movements in order to sell the crowd who are like, like you know, hundreds of feet away, um, you know, for, from the stage. So uh, yeah, it, it it would be interesting to see like, or what if they threw in like a George Takei in there, you know, uh, they, they interracial couple. In Twilight Zone, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, so and, I, and and that you know that could have been something on the table because the Twilight Zone had like one of the first TV episodes with an all black cast, so mm -hmm. you know, um, George Takei does show up eventually in an episode which was one of the ones they kept out of syndication for quite a while too, just for being you know, somewhat harrowing and, and things like that. So uh, we'll get to that one when we get to that one. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was sitting here thinking, I couldn't quite think of like a Twilight Zone actor that would fit the bill other than Shatner. Also keep in mind that I'm pretty laser focused. So I'm really thinking first season and up to this point in the second season. But um, right. here, here's, I, I don't know why this popped to mind. It would almost be like the opposite effect, but that could be interesting too. Um, one, we're going to have to move this to a pub in, in the countryside of England instead and take about five to ten years off of his age in 1960. Well, Peter Sellers, because uh, like we said, Shatner, you got the legacy, you got the package. He's all there where Peter Sellers, there's like nobody home. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. his wives and friends would say like there's just nobody there. He's acting or there's nothing there. And I feel like that would be an interesting effect in this episode. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, there's um, there's something to be said about you know taking like again the architecture of this episode and trying to find that the actor who I think would probably be a little bit more sympathetic because you know at this time you know at, at that age you know 29 William Shatner very good looking you know chiseled you know you know uh, very fit he's the kind of guy that you don't really worry about you know um, when he leaves the diner. The couple that comes in afterwards, you know, they're a little older. They almost look like um, they're empty nesters, and it looks like their their lives are, you know, they're in a downward spiral. And they don't really know how to get out because they don't look like there's a lot of promise ahead of them. And they 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 uh, they costumed and they the, the makeup and kind of like the overall look of them. They just looked beaten down, and maybe that's what life has done to them. So if you get an actor and actress that plays the carpenters differently and makes them look differently and maybe a little more homely and sympathetic where you're like, you know what, they're hinging on like the, you know, the fortune of every penny and every ticket that comes out to the point where you really see it, like take a toll on them physically, you know, now I know it's going to be a longer story than like what, 25, 26 minutes that you get. But at the same time though, there's just something about uh, the, the two that they cast, you know, William Shatner and uh, Patricia. They just seem a little safe from the the damage that the uh, machine is causing them. Maybe because that's the point. Maybe because they're at that tipping point of we're still young, we're still hopeful, we're still op we'll, we're still optimistic, and we can leave um, as long as you know we get our you know uh, our, our uh, the support system going between each other and say like we're going to leave this place. But now you get a Peter Sellers in that's a really interesting thought because he can play. Uh, wounded very quickly. You know, he can play, you know, despondent very quickly. And that's the thing that this machine would do to something like him, you know, or someone like him. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the interesting thing about this episode is like, it's, you can insert X actor here. And then what would the result be? Would, would the result be the, the result that you want? Or would it be the, the same result every single time? Because the story is, you know, holds up, you know, an expectation, you know, just in terms of the beginning, middle, and end. I, I guess that's the thing. Since there is only an inferred supernatural element in here, that means whatever the, the whole twilight zone of this episode is someone's delusion and different people are going to get to different delusions in different ways. So, right. yeah, that's where, I, where I'm like, oh, Sellers would get to a very different one, but I think it would still be a pretty satisfying one, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, again, you'd, you'd see him probably get racked by these different, you know, Shatner's just kind of like bull in a china shop with all these fortunes, right? Whereas right. Uh, Sellers would probably like kind of shift and go into different emotional states as he gets different answers and makes different senses out of them. I mean, and, and with the same script, right? This is all right. in the acting. <laughs> so, 
That um, would be such a great, like an interesting, um, you know, like one of those kind of anthology type of exercises where you would get four or five different stabs at this exact same story. Like, could you imagine like a Sam Raimi, you know, directing this the way that he does, you know, like extreme angles and, you know, the way that he just goes a little bit more on the kooky side of, of directing. And then you would get, um, you know, get another, another couple of directors and all see their own, you know, interpretations of it. But, uh, you know, I, that's, I think that um, I, I'm going to go back. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like, like, like uh, maybe change one of my earlier statements. It's not that it's a bad episode. It's not that it's an average episode. It's an episode that I think is very malleable, right? You know, and that doesn't necessarily make it, you know, average or less than. It just makes it to the point where you can insert other uh, talents in place and see if you're going to get different results because the story has a lot of promise, you know? And I, I think the one thing that they did right, and they would probably overdo in today's storytelling is they probably would have today they probably would have made more of a backstory to the cook where he's like doing some type of like you know satanic sinister ritual in the back with a chicken fried steak you know and like infusing you know uh the tickets with you know some type of black magic now in, in this case it's just like he's just a dude there you know he gets people coming in and out he needs to push something before the before his produce or whatever like that goes bad and he is like yeah you know what i gotta clean up all these messes of paper like all over my table every freaking day because of these things it would have been interesting to see if a traveling salesman like dropped off like the next new one, you know, and that oh, traveling sales. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could have like... a little stinger like that for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, how do people get stuck into these mindsets these days? I I'm thinking like um, this is in quotations. What's on your mind? I mean, mm -hmm. that that's the, that I think that's the general Facebook um invite to write something i'm actually opening facebook to see if that's still the case i, I think it is yeah what's on your mind matthew <laughs> you know that's what facebook is asking me so is, is that the modern equivalent where we just get obsessed with uh different social medias that's not fortune telling that's you know that'd be more like the 1900 number right but <laughs> but it's, it's a good modern interpretation of it i mean you're just kind of like looking for something to to latch onto. And maybe that's that downward spiral that you go to like, you know, you're, I, I look at re, uh, feeds and I'm just like, you know, all of a sudden it goes from one or two statements into like, you know, an entire thread, like minutes worth of this devolved conversation. And you're just like, where did, where are you people coming up with the interpretations of what's being said? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, um, there's a certain sense of isolationism that's obviously that's that's been you know exacerbated by social media by covid you know by the separation of you know people from uh you know being in the office or being at school you know or being out in the workplace or being on playgrounds or like being at conventions you know and that that isolation isolationism does cause for a little bit of kind of you know a depression you know where people are kind of like grasping at straws for some kind of connection i think that's what that is i, I think that's kind of like the modern equivalent of you know, this desperation that's uh, trying to fulfill something, trying to like fill a, a, a hole or a void in someone's life for some reason or another. Yeah, because when Don Carter has his wife pulling the lever and handing him the fortune, I guess he's getting mm -hmm. that little dopamine kick that we get when we, you know, get a response to our social media. Sure. And the yeah. computer, the computer is pulling the lever in that case, right? Or your time is because, yeah, you're like, how many people are going to respond? And um, actually, I'll, I'll say I've, I, I, post these episodes in various places and some of the twilight zones i, I get that kick because a bunch of people are suddenly like oh yeah we we dig that cool right. I'm, I'm pressing a button i'm making a response some people that is one difference he's you know I, we're trying to at least interact with other people whereas um don is very much like kind of isolating him, himself even from his wife who's next to him pulling the lever <laughs> Well, I, it's kind of the same thing with, you know, when your phone goes off, you know, or a ding goes off, you know, or you see like a like, you know, a heart goes off to whatever you posted, you know, you, you it's kind of like the question is put out there. And all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, when you on social media using this dynamic, you know, you pose the question, you post it out there and that's kind of like the act of asking and then pulling down the lever or pushing the lever. And then all of a sudden the thumbs up or the heart or the smiley face, that's the ticket. Right, that's the ticket. Everything else after that is what's printed on the ticket. So you have this interesting kind of like endless loop of this dopamine effect, and it's very powerful. I mean, you know, psychologists have done this study over the course of time for generations, and it really just depends on 
you know, what strategy is going to have the strongest reaction? And then how does that reaction become something that it's so powerful that the addiction is almost unbreakable? And that's what was happening to Don. You know, the addiction to that was nearly unbreakable if it weren't for his wife. Another thing um, with, with the Facebook and just promoting stuff, I found that it tends to be disseminated more if, and I did this the first time, just like I was just trying to be funny, probably with the question, but Facebook loves it when you ask questions that people mm -hmm. can respond to. I mean, I think we all get these, like, I don't know if we all do. I certainly do the Quora emails, right? And they quickly, the algorithm quickly figures out which ones you're going to click on. So I just get a bunch of random questions about the Beatles into my phone every day, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, I mean, that, that's not even a joke. So, <laughs> so I probably get like five, like, okay, did Paul McCartney like really take a year off? I'm like, did he? That's interesting, right? All right. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, that's kind of a modern equivalent. And in this case, I just want pointless, you know, fab four factoids. But <laughs> well, I mean, if you had to, you know, if you had to do this in a modern story, would this be the vehicle that you would use? Would you use social media as the demon box? Is social media the demon box? Okay. Hey, um, all right. I, I'm, I'm going to I, I'm going to phrase this uh, trying to leave nothing political on it at all. But is this the same mindset that a few years ago would have marked the Q obsessy? <laughs> Perhaps. You've got the drops all the time. The drops are like the lever gets pulled. You get this vague thing that you're supposed to, you know, decide what, what the future means. You know, somehow that turns into a 102-year-old JFK is going to appear at Daily Plaza again. You know, it's weird. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's this, it's this interesting way of trying to deliver uh, the power of suggestion, you know, into uh, a group of people or a person or a select group of people that are, are are very vulnerable to that, you know, and it's not just political, uh, although, you know, their studies have been shown that there are, there's, there's a lot of kind of like infiltration with a lot of these mechanisms in place where they're pushing these messages out there, forcing people to make these decisions based solely on, uh, you know, the, the predatory strategy of, um, of the marketing that's out there, forcing them to, you know, uh, elicit a response, you know, from this marketing. So that's a far more, you know, um, orchestrated way of what was happening in the diner. You know, everything that Don uh, feared most, whatever the answer was on that ticket, it was just enough to be able to, uh, to connect those fears to the next level, you know, of his paranoia. And, I think that that's kind of like, it's a very interesting way of, of seeing like how modern marketing can still do that. You know, all you need is the power of um, the suggestion of, or, or towards a suggestible person, you know, towards a person who's vulnerable to that kind of statement. And then all of a sudden you're off to the races and then everything kind of takes care of itself for better or worse after that. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing uh, just, to finish, I thought there's the, the um, I'll, I'll give him a soft plug, the, the QAnon Anonymous podcast, which is kind of looking at it from the from more like the other viewpoint. And they're, they're not Q heads. But one point they do make is these people do have grievances and that grievance is being like kind of exploited. So in this case, Don, well, he's more he more has like no confidence right in himself, no self-esteem. And that's being exploited by this machine. And then, like you mm -hmm. said, the, the old haggard empty nest couple, the, the effect is that much stronger. Like they oh, yeah. really cannot get out of this town. Right. Right. And uh, maybe that's what happened to their family. Like maybe their children left them or left them early or you know, who knows, because, you know, this, this diner and the demon box is just one example of, you know, the, the personality traits that these couples have, you know, and maybe it's either um, in that couple, you know, it's a, it's a partnership of trust and support. So maybe in that particular couple, the empty nester couple, and I only say that because that's just kind of like the flavor I get off of them. Maybe they just don't have the, um, you know, the, that shared support, that shared discipline to be able to pull one or the other out of the downward spiral. So they both go down together. And I think that Pat is one of those kind of personalities where she's like, and, and she stood her ground. She's like, I don't like this. I don't know, know what's going on. It's like, you want to go in there? Fine. But I don't want to go in there with you. He is just very adamant. He's like, no, we're going to go in there and we're going to take care of this because the fortune telling machine's right. I, I really wish though, 
if they, I really wanted them to try other machines, right? And <laughs> that means that every single time he went back into the diner to try a machine, it kept spitting out those same messages no matter where he turned, right? So he always felt like the only place that made sense to me was the diner itself, not just that one particular booth. Because each booth, and even at the um, at the the bar, they all had a machine nearby. So it doesn't matter. Like uh, Pat said, why don't you try this one? And he kept looking at that couple to trying to like, he was like trying to stare them away, like shoo them off, like get away from my booth because that's the only one there that spoke to him in that way. I would have liked all of them to have done that at least once. Yeah, yeah, a little trial and error. But um, mm -hmm. I guess the whole point is he's not thinking particularly logically. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Before I hit my questions, um, we, we, we got we went quite a ways with, with your first note. Um, I don't know if you managed to hit some of your other ones or if you had another one you definitely wanted to throw out. <laughs> oh, I, I, we, we pretty much got to a lot of what I wanted to talk about for sure. Okay, cool. Then I will start throwing out some some of my, the questions I asked at the end of uh, all of these episodes. The first mm -hmm. one being, who exactly in this episode went into or through the Twilight Zone? Oh, I think I think Pat did. To be okay. honest with you, yeah. Okay, why why Pat then? I mean, you know, I feel like the obvious choice might be Don, but hey, I'm definitely more interested in hearing about Pat <laughs> because I think that she was observant enough to know the the manipulation that was happening. You know, she had like one foot in and one foot out. I think Don was obviously, he was just blinded by, you know, his paranoia. He was blinded by the effect of what was going on. But Pat saw it for what it was, but also experienced the, you know, the um, the allure of it, the allure of that 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 dopamine effect. But she was able to pull herself out of it and thereby being able to pull Don out of it. So I think that just from the her ability to observe both worlds happening at the same time, I think that she had a better understanding of where she went into, like what she was getting into, the Twilight Zone. Okay. Yeah, I, it, it, it's a little bit of a snarky answer, I guess. But I, I think in the end, I'm going to settle on the nobody did. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's where at the end of this episode last night, I went on weekends or went reading the Jerusalem uh, syndrome page because I was like, well, he is kind of just having like a small breakdown. <laughs> I mean, that this episode isn't, I mean, it's, it's in sharp relief. It's got, you know, Shatner shattering as hard as he can, but mm -hmm. it is, um, there's nothing. I mean, people get people, you know, get into weird modes of thought and we see two dudes do it in the same place. That's why I'm like, the location seems interesting, but I kind of like mm -hmm. calling this one an episode with nothing supernatural. You know, they, they're doing it to themselves, which is kind of, I guess that's twilight zoning in its own way, but <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, you're right. Um, sometimes like uh, with the Twilight Zone, I think we expect like some major turn of events, you know, like in masks or something, you know, like something's going to happen or, you know, uh, uh, you know, eye of the beholder, something like that, you know, where something grand happens. But I think the grand thing that happens in this episode is that they left because we know that another couple couldn't. So. Right. Right, exactly. But uh, again, people do get in weird frames of mind and unhealthy frames of mind, and it's not unrealistic that this sort of thing could happen. Like with the couple that really is stuck, I mean, that, that they're, I, I guess I would say they're a lot deeper in the Twilight Zone than our stars. That's they, fair. Um, yeah. When we did the season one breakdown, one of, one of the other uh, regulars was like, um, yeah, I think the Twilight Zone ends with... Uh, he was like the weirdest one. It's like, how does this person even go on with with Don and his wife? We know how they're going to oh, Don and Pat. We know how they're going to go on. They're going to go out of town. I guess he's going to be the world's youngest office manager. But uh, I don't know how that older couple is going to go on. How do they get make it to tomorrow? You know, <laughs> right. And you can substitute, you know, the demon box for any kind of addiction. You know, they could be alcoholics that can't get out. Right. You know, they could be, you know, push users that can't get out, you know, or, you know, gamblers that can't get out. Anything that has a high enough addiction threshold where they can't see, you know, the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, because they just can't get there. Right. OK, that that's that's a great lead into my next question. You just made it heavier, man, which is do they and, and we'll, we'll basic. Well, actually, yeah, let's focus on this on both couples. And um, do they deserve their trip to the twilight zone? Uh, 
does anyone i guess <laughs> well um uh, actually i would say, i would say don kind of does because this act the twilight zone if this even is the twilight zone um what is the show of course but i mean metaphysically like he ends up in a better place at the end right he's yeah. got a little more confidence uh he's got a, a bright future ahead of him so you know this experience didn't really harm him i mean his his wife might think he's a little weirder than before but <laughs> Well, didn't uh, didn't Ron at the very beginning say that they're on the outskirts of the Twilight Zone? So in terms of power threshold, they're not quite there. They're just kind of like, you know, they're, they're kind of like skirting around the edges of the Twilight of the Twilight Zone. And, and I guess that's the thing to say that the older couple was like firmly in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I like the way it like I. I'm surprised that we didn't see like any interaction from uh, the two women, like the two elderly women that sat down and had their shakes at the same table. Like they didn't at all get influenced by the box. They didn't even touch the box once, which I thought was interesting. So that box has no actual, like it doesn't radiate a power or an aura or any type of, you know, uh, any type of, um, again, mysticism or some type of supernatural power. So like, hey, you know, interact with me and then we can start our journey together. Now it's just, it's just, mm -hmm an inanimate box that you bring whatever you need to bring. It's like, I always love the um, example of Yoda's cave and the empire strikes back when Yoda says, you know, Luke asks what's in the cave and Yoda says only what you bring in with you. And Luke saw that as being literal and Yoda saw that as being kind of theoretical. Like, you know, if you bring in your fear and your doubt and your, your frustration, and your anger, that's in the cave, not the weapons, not the clothes, not, you know, the tangible things. It's, the metaphysical, the spiritual things follow you in there. And that's what followed Don into the diner and got manifested into that machine. Is that heavy? Yeah, I was, uh, this bugged me since I was a kid. I was like, can he try the cave again? <laughs> it's like a one time <laughs> thing. I mean, right. I, if I were Luke, I was like, wow, that was wild. What happens if I don't bring a lightsaber? You know, do I, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know, but maybe that's the whole point. You only go into the demon box once, you only go into the cave once. And, um, <laughs> And he failed. Yeah. And and that's where maybe that's where the couples are different. Don brought in his wife who while she was being the menial worker of turning the lever, she was able he brought her in with him enough that she could pull him back out. And that wasn't right. the case with the other couple. So um yeah, so the uh, so I'm gonna say Don deserved it, but the 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 older couple is just depressing. So Maybe they do deserve it. I don't know who they are, but uh, it's, it's a pretty dark path. <laughs> or what they've done in order to stay there. You know, that's the thing. We saw what Don, you know, his what his decision process was to keep going back into the diner. I mean, you know, he even, um, he even tried to force the coincidence to happen when he ran across the street and passed the truck, but not pa quite past the car and almost got Pat killed. So what happened to that other couple? you know, that forced them to keep coming back. What did they do, you know, or what did they prove, you know, or put themselves in a position to prove that this box had that kind of sway over them, that kind of, you know, that, that, that influence, because it has proven them right time and again. Yeah. And it, 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 again, a matter of perception, right? It's like how much magic do you see in this place or how much mm -hmm. fortune telling, like um, another example, I teach kids and I, I use playing cards for games and that class activities and especially the younger ones when i take my deck out I, I can shuffle properly you know i can do the bridge and all that and they're like he's doing magic tricks i'm like no man i'm shuffling the cards <laughs> <laughs> this is for a game folks there's no magic involved today <laughs> the other fun things when i start dealing cards and i just assume it's old maid i'm like no we, i never play old maid <laughs> kids want to play old maid i guess is the the thing there but uh how do they know that it's crazy <laughs> um the last question I throw on these episodes is this is not a quality rating. This is a tripometer from zero being not trippy at all to five being extremely trippy. Um, I do accept decimal points, strange noises, um, any, anything like that. But where would you like to place this episode on the tripometer? I will give this a firm 2.7 tickets. Okay. Yeah. You want to define that? <laughs> Two full tickets for the 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 quality of the the, the writing, the, the acting was obviously fantastic, if I say so myself. <laughs> um the point seven is uh 
seven points for almost getting to three because I really wish that they involved Pat a little bit more in the decision making process with the tickets. I think it would have been interesting for her character. Okay. So. I'm going to go a little higher on this one. Um, I do enjoy vagueness. I find vagueness to be relatively trippy. So I, I decided to bump this to a four. Mm -hmm. Also because the machine, the machine is like a whole point for me. So <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that is the kind of merch. I'm like, do I want to, I, I'm not going to, am I going to buy that? I just don't know. <laughs> but see that that's, that's kind of like the dynamic of the machine itself. You see the machine. Do I want to buy it? Why? Because I want to push the lever why because i want to get the ticket why right no, no i don't want then, it i don't want to push the lever i don't like fortune telling i want people to come to my house and they push the lever of course then maybe i can't get rid of them so <laughs> that's well yeah so but that's i, I want I, to be the cook i guess <laughs> yeah push the chicken fried steak that's another thing I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna like give more points to the I'll, I'll give it a i'll give it a solid three because the cook was so surly and awesome right he's just he's there and like he doesn't need to be there or doesn't even really need to speak but he does and you're like, why? Like, is he pushing something subliminally like in front of them that we're not seeing? Except for like crappy food choices? It's making me think of an old SCTV sketch, which is, has Dave Thomas um, doing a commercial for Grumbles. It's like the food's not that great. You won't like the service, but no one will bother you. <laughs> <laughs> Grumbles. But hey, sometimes all of us want to go to Grumbles, right? So <laughs> if the service is good, you know. Then the service is not great. It's surly. No. Food's just like whatever, but no one will bother you. So that's cool. at least it's honest, you know. At exactly, least it's honest. honest. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to throw out any any final thoughts on this one? You know, I, I really, I'm really interested to see like if this could if this could be successful told today with like certain obvious like uh, you know tropes in place, like social media being like one that we talked about or just one of those like weird modern interpretations that you would see where, you know, a bunch of uh, maybe younger people, you know, like college students or like, say just more impressionable people. I'm, I'm not saying that college students are, but you're in that phase where everything is, you know, uh, live or die, you know, like every decision is major, you know, am I going to get a new job? Am I going to fall in love? Am I going to meet the right person? Am I going to lose everything? You know? And then all of a sudden this one strange prop appears, whether it's like, it would be cool if you just dusted off this demon box because everyone would know what it was, right? But if what if it was just like, you know, like a Ouija board, you know, or an, a magic eight ball or something that like, you know, um, or a bag of fortune cookies, you know, that they find in a pantry, something that just, you know, exacerbates the, the problem that's already there, the problem of kind of like, uh, you know, having a weak constitution, they're in there, the... Um, uh, the inability to make, you know, proper decisions, you know, because of whatever is happening in your life. So I've always liked this. The same thing with Star Trek. I've always liked to see, or I am, am excited to see like what the modern interpretation is, because there is interpretation of the storytelling that's told in like 1960, based on, you know, the flavor of what superstition and addiction means at the time versus now. Right. So especially when it comes to, is this the allegory of addiction? you know, or an addictive personality, you know, into the downward spiral, or it's kind of like the addiction of the dopamine response. So it would be so cool to see like that. I don't know, maybe like a fan film can address that. But Actually, it be like Jordan Peele got halfway there for you. Um, I was just thinking there's an episode replay, which is very different circumstances, but about, mm -hmm. um, in this case, a, a mother and son trying to get out of a town. Um, and I was like, well, that's that's a little bit like this one. So then I, I just looked at the Nick of Time trivia and it has the replay. And this is the episode replay an episode of the 2019 revival series features a shot of the mystic machine in a cafe. So they actually ah. did put the machine in that. So um, it, it is a very different episode, a very good episode. But um, it, it, someone else was having that. Well, someone else that was making the show had the same thought, apparently. So <laughs> well, it is. A, I mean, would you consider this? a famous episode because it's good or it's a famous episode because it's Shatner. Shatner plus demon head. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Very iconic then a very iconic episode because there are two big icons, you know, filling the space. Yeah. I mean, there are episodes. I mean, this one does have like, it does have that existential dread that, you know, colors some of the better episodes, but 
it is missing like the full on supernatural edge because uh you know some of the twilight zones that's why the question is do they deserve it because sometimes it's inevitable you know it's impossible to avoid this one had you get choices in nick of time right mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the, the old even the older couple could decide to leave if they really wanted to right right yeah and that's uh i guess that's the 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 big question is like what power does it hold over them and it's not supernatural it's psychological obviously exactly but um i, I guess we'll wrap up today so uh Norman, if you want to tell people what's what's up in Mission Nog land, I'm looking at the date in Japan. It's Star Trek Day already, so uh, oh. too early. But uh, maybe I'm hoping we hear something about Prodigy on Star Trek Day. So yeah, no kidding. So do I. <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me on. And uh, Matthew, uh, as you have told your audience, I am one half of the team that is the hosting team for Mission Log, a Rod and Barry Star Trek podcast. You can find us and all of our podcasts at podcast.roddenberry.com. You can also find us at missionlogpodcast.com. And we go through every single episode of Star Trek from the beginning to the present and look for the morals and meanings and messages and see if these episodes stand up to the test of time. We are right now in a little bit near the halfway point of season two of Voyager. We also cover in modern Star Trek, Lower Decks on our Mission Log live show every Monday night on Facebook. And then we are also hoping for, as you said, a release date for the second half, episodes 11 through 20 of Star Trek Prodigy, which we do have on our YouTube channel. That's uh, Roddenberry Entertainment on YouTube. So please sure to check us out on all those different networks. That being another show where it's like, ah, I think I need some of that merch. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely need uh, some more Murph merch, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you know? yeah. I have to make do for now with this this ten buck Millennium Falcon oop I found on something. It's and still fellow, awesome. Fellow, my you know computer. why? Because yeah. it's in the power. It's 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 bigger than it is because it's fueled by the power of your imagination, just like the Demon Box. That's true. It's also like '80s diecast, which is awesome. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I gotta love that <laughs> tiny starships. And uh, yeah, right. I guess. Uh, just to, to tell people, you are coming very close to both Threshold and Tuvix, if I'm, if I'm correct. You are correct, sir. <laughs> um, John Champion, I do believe, is scheduled to do the uh, the synopsis and breakdown for Tuvix. I will be doing Threshold, which thrills me to no end because that is so far my favorite episode of Voyager. Yeah, just thinking about Voyager, it's like I think everyone's favorite episode is one that most people consider terrible. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite ones being um i think they're back to back even is a uh, course oblivion and um the fight with chaotic space i won't tell you more than that and it'll be season five before you get to this but <laughs> awesome i mean i'm looking forward to i know that when we were at the, the convention i never everyone like shout out like some guts you know i'm like okay I know what it is. I know the rocks in it. So everyone calm down. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last season. You got it. So you got some time before you get to the rock. Yeah, probably. An, I, I think like, um, so we try and do obviously an, an episode, you know, per week. That's 52 weeks. That's 26 episodes per season ish, except for seasons one and two. So we're looking at uh, probably, yeah, maybe three total years, maybe three and a half total years, you know, before we get to enterprise. Yeah, that's you know that's what I'm doing with the Twilight Zone here because I'm like sometimes I mean these are fun to do right I, I hope you think so but I think these are fun I to loved do. it so I'm like I I'm love like, being on yeah some sometimes I'm like should I put out two a week I'm like no don't don't do that there's some podcasts where I stop listening to them a lot because they put out too many episodes so yeah you just got to pace like yeah pace everything because yeah for sure but no I had a great time this was so much fun and I'm I'm looking forward to like looking at an episode that doesn't have obviously the you know, the big draw for me in this episode is William Shatner. And I apologize everyone for um, the William Shatner impersonation. Sometimes I'm on point, sometimes I'm not, but I, I think that's the same for William Shatner. Sometimes he's on point with himself and sometimes he's not, you know? So, uh, but the thing is, is that he's always an interesting performance, isn't he? Yeah. That's why people, I mean, we also, we kind of love to hate him. I mean, what he did, didn't he just say something like a few weeks ago, like alienate half the Star Trek fans again. So Something I like, don't yeah. even, you know, and I don't even really pay attention to a lot of that stuff because I can't change what he said and I'm not going to change anyone's opinion on what they believe he said. So all I know is, does this episode of 
the Twilight Zone entertain me? Absolutely be yeah. because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking also, for him as an entertainer. This is what your great grandpa says, you know? <laughs> 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 I mean, you, you don't know what's going to come out of the guy's mouth. But the, the way I see it with famous people, I mean, there's a certain, you know, there, there, there's, there's Kevin Spacey level, which is a different thing. But in general, if people have mm-hmm. like a few foibles, I'm like, well, do I have to deal with them in my kitchen? No, because uh, I, I, that's that's why I kind of understand about Shatner, like when he rubs people the wrong way. It's like apparently he's just like he never stops practical joking, basically. So if that he, annoys you, you will hate the man. <laughs> yeah, he, he's rubbed people the wrong way for decades, you know, mm-hmm. and that's fine. You know, you, you can choose not to or to like him. That is your choice. You know, mm-hmm. you can you can turn him on. You can turn him off. That's the great thing about entertainment. You know, it's like Howard Stern said, if you don't like me, change the channel. <laughs> Well, or I guess it's finally time that we try and get out of this this podcast town, this town of podcasts. So, smash the machine. Oh, they didn't smash the machine, did they? We can smash the machine. I just want to smash. I can't though. I I can't decide whether or not I need to push the button again. I need that ticket, Matthew. I need it. Okay, that seems like a good cut spot. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you much for joining in. Um, actually, I will. This is I. I I'll offer you one that does well. It still is Burgess Meredith, but that's a different thing. I don't think the Penguin's quite as uh, iconic as Shatner. Very yeah, iconic. but see, that, that's the thing. It's like I I want to like the episodes I like, and you know, here's another thing. Like here's an episode I didn't know I didn't know if I was jumping the timeline, but you know, I shot an arrow into the sky. That's not necessarily Twilight Zoney. Yeah, we did that one, and uh, we actually yeah. I think had some thoughts of that one. You know, with Rod Serling having written a draft of Planet of the Apes was like the one segment of them kind of trawling through the deserts, very Planet of the Apes. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I always like that one. I, I Again, the, um, I think it's called Masks or Faces. It's the one where, um, you know, like the really shitty stepchildren or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, where yeah. The, I you know, think and, that's the last season, if I remember correctly. It's it's the I, third or it's the third or the fifth. So okay, that's a that. I mean, it was just a smart idea. Like, yeah, you gotta you get turned into kind of like the avatar of your own, you know, uh, seven deadly sin. You know, like greed or you know anger or jealousy or whatever. Um, I like the one where uh, the 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 I guess it was kind of like a Puritan lady, like she's getting attacked by like NASA astronauts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. Um, oh God, that's not the Invader. Maybe that's you see when we started, you're like it was Shatner and the Invader, and I think the name of that Twilight episode is uh, the Invader. <laughs> that was pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, that that one's coming relatively soon. Um, I, actually, I could probably pin you in for that. Uh, the one I was looking at, I actually originally um offered offered to John, but he was like he doesn't want the bonk bonk on the head episodes, right? Or yeah. Uh, which is the last one of the season, the the obsolete man, which uh, I would be bugging you about that probably come January, February. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, just uh, I, these are fun because like when I watched it, like the two things that really stuck out to me the most. I mean, aside from William Shatner's acting, was this the weird Rocky cam at the beginning because it was just a weird way to establish, and maybe that's the point. Like everything's a little jumbly, like nothing's really quite settled, you know. And I know that in the 1960s, that kind of TV. You're using that that stylistic element as a way to kind of like frame like the storytelling, like this is what's happening, like everything's a little wacky. And then shooting through the trellis and then pulling back, I thought that was really interesting. You know, yeah. I, I wonder if know, that was kind of the effect shot. Usually there's like some interesting effect shot, like they give the cameraman like something cool to do or you yeah. know, change the lighting, something like that. That might have been the shot for this episode because otherwise it didn't really have one. Right. It was like it shot them as they came through the diner door. And then it, when it pulled back, you could see the diamond of the trellis. And then, you know, then and and uh, into that room. And they used the trellis to really good effect with some of the lighting, you know, um, more dramatic lighting elements at times. But it was just a weird choice. It was so extreme. I'm like, <laughs> did you get what you needed to get out of that shot? Because it was so extreme. <laughs> Okay. But it was fun though. It's I haven't I haven't watched the Twilight Zone episode in quite some time. And uh, no, CBS, even for me, there's a lot of these I haven't seen. I've pro- like um I, I've sent some episodes. I have a, I actually just sent it to my friend Tokyo, but I, I had a brick of about um maybe sixteen discs. They all have three or four episodes. That's like a third of the series. That's why I had for twenty years. So okay, uh, you know, last year's when I got the Blu-ray, so I, I got them all now. But uh, and I'm working through them. I, I don't 
I, I, when I first got it, of course, I went and jumped ahead and watched some of the iconic ones or ones that I'd never seen that I was really interested in. But now I'm pretty much keeping myself from watching ahead too far. You know, like I'll whatever I'm doing in a month, I'll give it like a pre-watch and give it a watch with the right. notes, like, and then probably one the night before. So I, I actually do watch these, like you guys watch Mitch and Log, which uh, of course these are 25 minutes long, so it's easier. But <laughs> well, I try not to jump ahead because because you know, I know that I'm gonna eventually going to have to watch it anyway. So I'll yeah. just, I kind of like do my show and then get all that because I have to do um, maneuvers. You know, it's the one I'm not sure if you know this one. But it's, it's the one where like Seska comes back and she captures Chakotay and steals his DNA so she can get pregnant. It's maybe it's the next one I have to watch. I uh, well, I had my own my COVID holiday in early August, so I got several Voyagers ahead. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's but, just uh, a weird one. I, I'm kind of like, yeah, uh, like season two is just a little like, and oh, I, I need an episode. I, it's probably going to be threshold where it just like jump starts my battery. I'm just like, man, these episodes. Some of these episodes are lame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have the um, the better or for worse thing of pretty much knowing where I probably got infected, you know, because I teach kids and stuff, right? So I'm teaching a class of five-year-olds and I got a mask on, but they're taking them off and one kid's like coughing and they're coming up crawling on me and like trying to pull my mask off. And I'm like, uh, that's, it's, and it's my worst class too. And I'm like, I bet that's where I got it from. Uh, that sucks. <laughs> uh, on the plus side, I basically, the, the symptoms were about 12 hours and then I was just like sitting around in my house for a week. So, <laughs> okay. So, so it know. wasn't wasn't like it, that's why I called it my COVID holiday. So it wasn't that, except for the fact that I would like to go places, you know, it wasn't right. so bad, but it sounds like, are you still clear from, from the, the new version of con crud? Cause I was yeah. on the discord. A lot of people seem to have uh, actually picked it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I was around all those people too. Um, I think a lot of people may have picked it up like on the plane ride back. I've heard that before, you know, people have, have tested, you know, at the convention and they feel that they were okay. And then they were like, well, if I wasn't masked and at the convention, then I'm probably safe. Then they get back on a plane and then that's where they usually like contract. But um, the only thing that I felt was just a little bit of just kind of the exhaustion when I got back, but I think that's just normal. And I had some sinus issues, but I tested four times, all four negative, no fever, no lingering effects. So yeah, that could, you know. be jet, that could be jet lag, really. So, <laughs> Yeah, John and I were burning it pretty hard before we got there. And when we were there, we burned it pretty hard. So I, I think a lot of it was just, you know, it was, adrenaline's a hell of a thing. When I got on the stage the first time, when I was on with Robert Sawyer and, and John and James Kerwin, um, I was kind of like, I was nervous, but I didn't know how nervous I was. And then I put down, I was drinking coffee. Then I reached down to put my coffee cup down and my hand started shaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I said, that's adrenaline. That's, that's easily adrenaline. So I put it down and then my knees, like the whole time, my knees were kind of like, you know, in that locked position, they locked, they weren't <laughs> like, I wasn't relaxed. They were locked together to the point where at the end of like the half and uh, 45 minute session, I stood up and I literally had to sit there for like 30 seconds for like the blood to come back to my legs. I mean, they were like that locked. Uh, and then in the, the afternoon when we were having lunch, I was just exhausted. I'm like, no, I slept well. Like, why am I so tired? I'm like, it's the adrenaline after effect. Mm. You know, when you're, when your adrenaline goes like rushes really high, your body like seizes up, you know, and it's kind of like fight or flight mode. That's where the adrenaline comes in. And when it comes down, you come down from adrenaline really hard, you know? So I'm sitting there at lunch. I'm like, wow, I'm really tired, but I'm really hungry and I shouldn't be tired. So after that, I was fine, but you're always, you're, you're kind of like when you're doing a lot of stuff, at the convention, you're like on this, like very even like adrenaline push. I think that's where John was, you know, and it keeps you from getting sick. And when you get home, you just crash and burn. You just crash and burn and, and you feel like you're sick. Yeah. It's a dragon con in Atlanta. So, you know, the lot, same sort of thing there with a lot of people, you know, just is it concrete or did I actually get sick or yeah, you know, what? <laughs> But you've been to Dragon Con. I've never been to Dragon Con. I was about to say I've, I've actually um I, I I was actually on the After Dark where someone asked, oh we've all been to conventions and there's like 15 people. I was kind of saying I, I haven't. <laughs> no. But um you know when I was growing up like high school university I was playing in bands so I was in concerts all mm -hmm. the time instead of conventions and then I did a few years where I basically worked out in the middle of nowhere so uh -huh. no conventions. Then I moved to Japan and Japan has conventions but not the ones I'm going to go to so. <laughs> Or like, and I hate to say the stereo. Is it like the stereotypical anime convention, or uh, one of them is? Yeah, it, it, it's okay. 
It's called Tokyo's Big Sight, which, oh, that must look amazing. By sight, they mean S-I-T-E. This is just a place. But yeah, uh-huh. they have a giant anime convention there. Also, I live in Nagano. It's in the mountains. So uh-huh. you know, I, I'm, I don't live in Tokyo at all. Uh, I live pretty boondocky. Um, like, I'm going to take a 50-minute train ride after actually pretty much after hanging up here and uh go to a medium-sized city but where i i live um when i say uh, sometimes i i'm like hey folks i'm walking through the rice fields I'm, i mean i'm not in the rice field i'm on the street next to the rice field but it's mm-hmm. five minutes out it looks like hard countryside for my house which is pretty awesome i like that but <laughs> it sounds nice but not great for a conventioner so <laughs> yeah true but, but you're uh, i mean your your internet signal is strong for being out in the countryside Japan has good internet. <laughs> yeah. I never have a problem. But yeah, for me, just this is my convention, right? I, you know, get roll out of bed most mornings and then talk fandom with you know people. That that's that's like a and then people tons of people listen to it. So that's that's a yeah. convention. So, you know, make your own convention, I guess. <laughs> well, that's what Discord was. You know, that's like when we did all of it, it was just to have everyone just be able to talk to each other instead of being like locked away and in, in, you know, in their COVID isolation. So, you know, it's it's taken on like a different form, which is great. But you know, that that's why I encourage more people on Discord to say, hey, you know what? You guys are paying for this server with your subscription. So you can create like chat channels. And if you guys want to get together and talk about anything, you could put together a channel and say like, you know, the Twilight channel, right? If you want to bring people together and talk about Twilight Zone on a live channel, like we do with After Dark, go ahead. Like, that's what I want. I want more people to do that. You know, I don't want them to say like, Norm, can I have permission? Like, it's like, no, you do it. Right. As long as it's like not off- like pacify me first, as long as like not offensive and people aren't like, you know, getting in trouble. Yeah. I mean, I got a b- good block of time. I might get to you about that. But uh, yeah, right now it's um, I've, I've just been commandeering your your 60 sci-fi channel. I've been like, <laughs> oh, that's uh, it. But that's what it's there for, though. Right. You know, and, and then, of course, the food. My family is like, you're like a high school girl because I take pictures of my I did. I used to never take pictures of my food. Now I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually the, the discord's fault. Um, oh, one other Discord. I actually started watching Atlantis last night. When when are you starting Atlantis? Did you start Atlantis? Not yet. So um, Stefan uh, Vut, uh, he I probably just butchered his name again. He said I always do. Anyway, he's from Finland. Uh, he had a he and Paul Harvard had a great idea. They're like, right, so are you going to finish up Arc of Truth and continue him? You know, for Stargate Sunday. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea because I did watch him on the plane. I love. They were great. So this Sunday we're going to finish up the entirety of SG one with arc of truth and continuum that like finishes everything, you know, from children mm-hmm. of the gods to now. And then let me take a look at my calendar. So that's the 14th. Um, no, that's the 11th. And then the 18th, I might do, I might start Atlantis, but the thing is like, I'm gone for like the next two weekends because I'm traveling with my mom mm-hmm. and then I'll be back. Uh, for the entirety for the rest of the year. So I might finish up SG-1 on the 11th and then not do anything until I get back on the 9th. Okay, so, that, that's cool. That, that's cool for me because like last night I, I watched 20 minutes, fell asleep, woke up. It was like an hour 40 into the pilot. It's like, okay, I watch that again. <laughs> the rising's good. Um, And if you want, like the whole thing with that is like there's the end of season eight, the beginning of season, no, the end of season seven, the beginning of season eight, and then rising. So they all kind of like work. There are like two, two, three, two hour episodes, two parters, um, where they introduce like Dr. Elizabeth Weir um, and the whole Atlantis thing. And that's the way I watched. That's the way that the guys on the Stargate channel told me to watch it. So um, if you want, it makes interesting watching because they switched out Elizabeth Weir. Oh, right. And- Austin. Try. This, this is kind of funny my first watch of atlantis was like 10 years ago and uh, mm-hmm. i was like you know oh she's kind of matronly right <laughs> now now i'm in my mid 40s i'm like oh, she's kind of cute is it to- who tori <laughs> Ten years later yeah. uh, uh, no, no, the, doc- the, the doctor the, yeah <laughs> it was like 10 years ago she she was like oh a handsome old woman as picard would say and now i'm like oh that's someone in my age range what do you know <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's right that's exactly right you know it's it's and it's funny too because uh i think like say like i have the biggest crush on amanda tapping i think that she's only like five years older than i am maybe six Mm-mm, right so yeah just because i think she's like yeah i think she's 56 i'm 50 so yeah i mean that was just my I, I felt like that was my horrible first take you know watching it last night but that was my first take i was like 
I don't remember being that cute. <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> exactly so, because but, i guess uh, when 10 years ago she wasn't so <laughs> it's, it's just perspective not yet like not necessarily like the women that we were watching 10 years ago exactly right? yeah <laughs> um, oh cool uh, man um I, I appreciate you having me on i really do it's uh, i'm sorry that it took so long for me to come back no no problem because that the one like i said these are so fun to do it gives me the uh benefit that i do them like way ahead of time i mean this one doesn't even air for two and a half weeks still. So, okay. <laughs> so I'm wondering, uh, like, we never actually went for the, you know, for the title, but do you think Nick of Time is that he left in the Nick of Time so that he didn't get bogged down? I can go with that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. What, would, what would be another, what would be another, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other good, like, it's, yeah, that probably makes sense. Left in the Nick of Time or yeah, just yeah, in the Nick of Time. Be, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I guess that's probably why we didn't get into it. Yeah, title game's always good, but I think that one's pretty obvious. Um, yeah. A lot of Twilight Zone titles do tend to be pretty much, you know, like there's not a whole lot of uh, interpretation needed. You know, right? Eye of the Beholder. You know, that's pretty much on the on the nose. Um, right. The one I was mentioning to you, maybe coming back for the Obsolete Man. Uh, once you see that, that's very on the nose. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The silence. You never, you never felt like doing like the outer limits, the old outer limits as a part of oh, your repertoire. Well, I, I don't know how long I'll do this. That's why I introduced it as Twilight Zone and Beyond. So um uh, my roadmap, I think, is going to be after this going straight to the 80s series. Ah, uh, okay. And then doing the early 2000s one if I can find it. It doesn't seem to be readily available at the moment, although it might be on YouTube for all I know. Um, mm -hmm. but if I don't do that, that means I get to jump straight ahead to the Jordan Peele one. So that's kind of fun too. Cool. And then after that, go back and do night gallery, get back to Rod Serling mm -hmm. after that. And then, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the ones that are actually on my shelf. So it probably wouldn't be the outer limits, but, uh, the ones on my shelf currently are, well, night gallery, Ray Bradbury theater, mm -hmm. tales from the dark side. Yeah. I got the nice. ones up there. So yeah. that is why I say beyond. That's one of the reasons, like, should I do this faster? I'm like, nah, just do it at the, the clip that people want to listen to it. So nah, your speed is fine. You know, the thing is you don't want to bring yourself out either. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, I like I like I said, there's a couple podcasts where I mostly stopped listening to them just because they're like another bonus episode this week. Three hours. I'm like, I don't want that. <laughs> just give me, you know, <laughs> give yes, me you got time. it. Give it even pace, man. So people are like, yep, here's my week. Here's my download. You um, know? I'm going to go catch my tram. If I will share my, my, you know, I listen to the Patreon via the mission log. So just, it might be curious for you to hear my, um, how I listen to that. Um, I can always tell you folks if it doesn't download, cause, uh, it's 10 at night when it uploads and I get off the train at 10 20. So I walk over to where the baseball store that has Wi-Fi. get uh -huh. it, listen until you actually start the show. And then stop uh -huh. it, and then uh, now we're today. So during my lunch break, I have a very specific walk where I'll listen to the rest of it. So <laughs> cool. You can cool. you can imagine nighttime countrysides and a Japanese cityscapes uh, accompanying your your podcasts. <laughs> well, I'll enjoy the uh, stuff that happens on Star Trek Day. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some good news. Yeah, I got I got to wait yeah. twelve. I got to wait what twelve hours for everything, don't I? So news, lower decks, all of that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, let me hit uh, this button.